Sure. So either the benefit or the downside of going towards the end, we'll find out when you guys give your feedback, is I had a prepared speech with hard copy just in case <laughs> technology failed. It's going to highlight what I've highlighted before. You know, I, worked as, I work as a, a football official, and there's parallels between that being a judge. I'm going to highlight my work ethic, collegiality, legal writing and uh, research skills, and my relevant experience and why that qualifies me. But as the day went on and I rehearsed the speech over and over again, it came off as that, rehearsed. So on my drive over here, I came up with the idea of let's treat this like a Court of Appeals oral argument. Let's hit some highlights and then open it up for questions and kind of go off the cuff and see if that comes off a little bit better. Uh, I know that I can be pretty dry, especially when giving speech, and so hopefully it livens things up a little bit at the end of the day here. Three things that I want to talk about are why do I want the job? Why am I qualified? And what sets me apart makes me the shining star? And I stole this from Commissioner Graber during our individual interviews, three things to talk about. <laughs> When I was a third year law student, I had the opportunity to argue in front of the Iowa Court of Appeals through a clinical program at Drake. Uh, now, Court of Appeals Judge Mary Tabor was the assistant county attorney that was, or assistant attorney general that was arguing on behalf of the state. I think it was Judges Sackett, Danielson, and Vette Sworn presided over the bench. And I got to be in the courtroom downstairs, go through my case thoroughly, and have the opportunity to present that to the Court of Appeals judges, and I just fell in love with that process. It requires you to have strong legal research and writing skills, it requires you to be able to think on your feet during the oral argument, and to just know your case inside and out. And back in the fall of 2009, I decided this is the path I'm gonna go down. I wanna be a Court of Appeals judge, and I'm gonna do everything in my career to set myself up, to put myself in the best position to do that. And why am I qualified for the judge, or to be a Court of Appeals judge? Because I've set myself up to be so. I started a private practice straight out of law school from scratch with law school classmates. We built a reputation of competence and integrity and built that firm up over the next 10 years. And I took the next step and joined the bench as a district associate judge in 2019. On that bench, I honed my skills in juvenile law and criminal matters. And I moved up to the district court where I now preside over general jurisdiction from family law to medical malpractice to employment discrimination and administrative appeals. And every step along the way, I've carried through those traits of work ethic, collegiality, and commitment to justice. And what sets me apart from the other applicants? I sit before you, I believe, the only uh, judge that served on both the district associate bench and the district court bench. Those give me two different perspectives in all cases that appear before the Court of Appeals. I put the statistics in my written applications, but about a third of the cases that appear before the uh, Court of Appeals come out of district associate court. And I have the experience as a juvenile ju uh, judge and a juvenile practitioner uh, that would enhance uh, the bench by bringing a different perspective. Also in private practice, I had an appellate practice. I argued in front of the Court of Appeals. I argued in front of the Iowa Supreme Court brief dozens of cases so I understand the appellate process, how it's different than the trial court and what makes a good record. So those things set me apart from the other candidates, my experience and what I've done to set myself up to sit before you here today. So with that, let's get to the questions. All right, we'll start that <coughs> with Jen, Commissioner Chase. Uh, thank you for your application. Um, I would like to hear more about your experience as a private practice attorney and how that has prepared you for the Court of Appeals. Sure, so in private practice, we started the law firm from scratch. So we did a lot of court appointed work. Uh, I did family law work, so I had served as a uh, law clerk for firms that did family law, I had some experience in that. And then as we grew, my partner Matt moved more into civil litigation. I stayed in those two areas, criminal, family, and <coughs> that includes juvenile. We kind of associate with family law. Um, I got the contract for juvenile drug court in Polk County, and that opened up a uh, completely different view of the court mm -hmm. system, trying to do restorative justice, working with young men and women in the justice system. So I got the experience in criminal court, representing real clients, indigent clients. Probably 75% of my cases were court-appointed indigent work. I represented people in family law cases where they're risking losing, seeing their children every day, where they're risking <coughs> assets. I worked in juvenile court as a private practice attorney where people did have their rights terminated to their children. You have to sit next to them, you counsel them through that year to sometimes two year long process. 
here's what we need to do, here's what we need to work on. You make the arguments in, in court, but ultimately sometimes they get adverse rulings and you have to counsel them through that. So um, representing people in private practice gave me tremendously different viewpoint and then just the practice areas that I participate in as a practitioner. Thank you. Commissioner Boyer. Judge Kim, thanks for your application. Um, you've answered my question, so I have no, nothing for her. Thank you. Commissioner Marquardt. Well, you answered my question in your opening statement, so I've had to come up with a second one. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I've heard about you um, in your time as a district court judge is the level of preparedness um, that you bring to summary judgment hearings. How will that skill or that work ethic uh, transfer for you to the Court of Appeals? So it's just ingrained in me. My dad, I've talked about him before, 53 years at Catholic cemeteries, 42 years, his second job as a hockey official. He taught me work ethic. He taught me to show up every day and do your best. When I <coughs> transitioned to district court with the way the retirements fell, we had the holidays and everything else, we had a couple of cases that were on my docket for months that had just been sitting there stale. They had trial coming up in a few months, and I needed to devote my attention to those and just dive into them and go. And as an attorney, I hated when you show up to a court here and the judge would go, oh, this is case, what are we doing here today? Oh, we're in a family law case. All right, counsel, what are we doing? And that's not the type of judge I wanted to be. I didn't like that experience. So I've gone in with the mentality that I'm going to come prepared for every hearing. I'm going to read all the briefs. I'm going to look through the appendices. I'm going to take notes and almost treat the summary judgment hearing like an oral argument. I've read your briefs. I don't need your PowerPoint. You can put that away. I don't need you to read your brief to me. Here's some questions I have. Here's, here's where I think you're going, but fill in some of these blanks for me. And I think that uh, goes well to the Court of Appeals and that similar uh, approach where you're reading briefs, you're looking at the record as a whole, but in the cases that do have or, oral argument, counsel fill me in, I've got some concerns about this or explain to me why this matters more than that. So I think that trans, uh, transitions well to the Court of Appeals. Commissioner DeFord. Yeah, thank you, Judge Kemp. And uh, you've already addressed a lot of the questions I had too, but I <laughs> want you to just explain in more detail um, uh, how you could contribute to the collegiality on the Court of Appeals. So I've met with <laughs> the nine current Court of Appeals judges, two former Court of Appeals judges, and universally the thing that they all say they loved about it the most is the collegial atmosphere down there on the third floor. They get along really well together. They work well together. Um, and it's something that I would definitely want to go in with the approach and definitely not take away from that, but try to contribute to that. And how do you do that? You let your personality shine through. Um, on the bench, I'm serious. I try to write orders that are very succinct, but back in chambers, it's okay to be goofy with your colleagues, ask about their families, play a little pranks on them here and then to keep things light. Um, so collegiality is important. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends, but you have to get along with each other and you have to respect each other in the work that you do. Thank you. Commissioner Parrish. As you know, uh, Judge Kemp, I'm a big fan of yours. But I do have a question that probably everyone is thinking. You were appointed district court judge, and you apply it now again for the Court of Appeals. What process did you use? I know there's no time limit to do that, a timeline. Could you tell us how you were thinking through that process and why you did it at this point in time in your career? Now, forgive me for that. If I appear in front of you, don't hold that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so first I'll pivot back to collegiality. One of my colleagues said, you're applying for Court of Appeals already? You're done with us? And I told, said, you know, I've been on here four, four and a half months. I've seen it all, done it all in district court. I'm kind of tired of you guys. <laughs> uh, but Court of Appeals has always been my end goal ever since I was in law school. And I've been upfront about that through every step in the process. When I became a district associate judge, I said, I want to move on from here. But if you select me, I'll commit myself to this job, and this is where I end my career. I'm going to be the best district associate judge I can be. Uh, Mr. Roberts is on the 5C commission and said the same thing during that interview. I have ambition for the Court of Appeals, but court, the district court is what's open. That's what I'm applying for now. I'm going to commit myself to that. I'm still going to go after the Court of Appeals because that's my end goal. Um, but if I don't get it, I'm going to be a great district court judge. Um, so thought process, there was a little bit of hesitation when the application posted so quickly of, hey, am I, is it a slight to my colleagues or things like that? But I've been open about my ambition and where I want to land, and I'm following through with that. Thank you. Commissioner Graber. Uh, I, I've enjoyed hearing 
about your experiences and your capabilities and you've got it like really dialed in to, to say why you would be a good person for this position on the Court of Appeals. Um, if I was able to give you a magic button that you push the button and it fills in any gaps that you may have, if you'd push the button, what kind of gaps do you think that you'd see in yourself as a candidate for this position? Government and agency law. I did private practice representing people. I never really represented government. I didn't represent agencies. That's probably 10 to 15 percent of what comes in the Court of Appeals. Luckily, there's plenty of Court of Appeals judges who have that experience to fill in that gap, but that would be it. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Schnur. What is it about being a district court judge that would make you a good judge on the Court of Appeals? So being a judge in general shows that you can make sound decisions, that you can issue rulings that apply the law, that you can be a neutral. On the district court, it just expands your areas of practice. You know, right now I'm on a general rotation, so last week I had three family law trials. A couple weeks before that, I had a class B meth possession of methamphetamine criminal trial. Uh, I've had employment discrimination cases. I've had a medical malpractice case that settled right before. So it gives you more of a diverse uh, set of areas of practice that come before you. And then the other thing that it does is just, this, and this might be Polk County specific, but on the associate court bench, my days were structured. I go on at 8, or at 8 o'clock, I'm burning through 50 to 60 cases, managing the courtroom, managing the chaos, and then when I go home at 4.30 most days, I'm done for the day. <coughs> when district court, it kind of ebbs and flows. Last week I had three trials. The week before that, I didn't have any trials. So it really makes you hone in on your time management skills. Um, I have a spreadsheet that every time I have a contested hearing, I write all the case details, when it is, and my assistant goes in and puts in a 15-day deadline, a 30-day deadline, 45 and 60 and you got to be able to manage your time effectively. Um, I've kind of been working through it's the former athlete mentality of just setting goals, and my goal right now that I'm working through is make every hour count. So you're going to have goof around time, you're going to go down the hall and talk to another judge, but if I can sit down at the beginning of every day and say, all right, hour by hour, I want to try to get this done and make every hour count, that's kind of the mentality I've been going in with. And that's so far been successful. 85% of my cases that I've ruled on have, been, have come out within two weeks of the hearing. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen. What do you perceive the impact of self-represented litigants? Self-represented litigants are becoming more and more common um, and they can be problematic. Sometimes it's people that just can't afford an attorney and need you to walk through the process. Sometimes it's people that no attorney will represent and <laughs> you, you have to deal with it. Um, I had a family law trial last week with a self-represented client and you try to ease the tension a little bit. You explain the process. You can't give legal advice, but you can explain the process. So it's a family law trial. All right, Mrs. Smith, we're going to have this trial. Your client or your ex-husband is the petitioner. He's going to present his case first. You'll have the right to ask him questions, and then you're going to present next, and then you can each call your witnesses. And if you want to present evidence, there's a process for doing so. And you kind of walk through the steps. You try to uh, be human, not up there in the black robe, pounding the gavel, saying, all right, here we go, 9 o'clock, let's start. Um, so <clears throat> pro se litigants, uh, like I said, they're becoming more and more common. And, you treat them right, um, you can get effective, you can get cases done effectively. Thank you. Commissioner Roberts? No questions. Commissioner Henderson? <laughs> I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Simmelrod? I was intrigued by what you said about how many cases come before the Court of Appeals that came from the District Associate Court bench. What, uh, what about your experience in that role is going to serve you well on the Court of Appeals? So a really big one, a glaring issue right now is juvenile justice. The Chief Justice just put together a task force to try to look at some reforms and things like that. Uh, district associate courts are the ones that are handling the child in need of assistance cases, the termination of parental rights where uh, Department of Health and Human Services is involved. So having that experience both as a lawyer going through that process and then being a uh, district associate judge where I'm presiding over those juvenile cases, um, I think really gives me the experience that would help aid this bench. Um, I can't remember the stat, it was 20% or something of cases are juvenile justice cases that come before the Court of Appeals. And I think that's another, I would uh, 
add additional strength to that bench coming in with that background and experience. Thank you. Commissioner Hardkoff. Having no questions, thank you. Commissioner Spees. Yeah, I was intrigued by that uh, as well. And uh, uh, another thing that intrigues me about uh, the judicial district in which you practice is what you said, I think, was, if I understood correctly, was something of a shortcoming about in, uh, not having a lot of experience in review of agency <clears throat> action. Did I understand you correctly? You haven't had much of that? One of my, if I could push the magic button and fill in a gap, I didn't do agency work as an attorney. Yeah. Um, and of course, Des Moines being, or Polk County being the hub of so much judicial review, uh, I'm sure you'll get a taste of that. Like I've had four so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got that fight, fatal admission from you now. <laughs> um, thank you for your application. And, uh, uh, you know, if you can be a, a judge on the Court of Appeals and, and be a, a referee at the same time, I think you've, you've met all the acid tests. Yeah. Thank you. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but my son asked something about why I'm doing it. She said, he, he does hard things. If, if you can understand that, you're, you'll understand it, Dad. There you go. He does hard things. Commissioner Hoig. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Stanger. Thank you. Hey, Judge, great to have you this afternoon. Thanks for applying. Um, we're on the yellow button here, so. One of the questions, um, or one of the things we've been urged to consider today is geographic uh, diversity and kind of this rural urban, um, I guess, perspective or paradigm. <coughs> um, obviously, you know, we're from Dallas County and Polk County, um, and the last two judges put on the Court of Appeals are both uh, guys from Polk County. How would you address um, that concern, or I guess that question that we've been been asked to consider today sure so specifically at the court of appeals level you have three from polk county right now you have three from the second judicial district you have one from third and one from sixth so you do have some geographical diversity you have some diversity of rural versus urban um, all your life experience comes into play i went to a small college in a town that tripled in size when school was in session i got a little bit of feel for that <coughs> small town environment and private practice, I stopped counting because when you go through the Iowa courts online and you look county by county, it makes you go through those little things to verify you're not a robot every time. I got annoyed, <laughs> but I got to at least a third of the cases, or a third of the counties in the state I've appeared in as a uh, practitioner. Uh, every judicial district, I've appeared in Dallas County, Polk County, Marion County, Warren County as a judge filling in when they need it. So I do have some of that background. I don't think it's as big of an issue at the Court of Appeals level um, as possibly at the Supreme Court where you have four or five from uh, the fifth judicial district. So I think there's some <coughs> geographical diversity. Um, and I think overall that if you've got life experience or different backgrounds, that that's not as big a concern. Thanks so much. Commissioner Picklap. I didn't think you were gonna make hey. it. <laughs> Thank you for your application. I have no questions. Counts on me. You just had to get I, that in. I cut two minutes from my speech. For you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, all right. You're welcome. All right. I'm back. No, I'm just. Joking. <laughs> Thank you so much for your application, and uh, um, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Judge. Thanks, Judge.